Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. But people who listen to this podcast know we don't always confine it to people. Sometimes we do animals. And tonight, since we're concentrating on sports, we're going to open with one of the great racehorses of the 20th century, Cigar, who died recently at the age of 24. Cigar won 19 out of 33 races in his career. He won $185 short of $10 million. And in 1995, he had one of the great seasons that any racehorse had in history, winning all 10 of his races, which earned him a trip down Manhattan 7th Avenue to Madison Square Garden, where he had a retirement party. The highlight of that great year for Cigar was the Breeders' Cup, where announcer Tom Durkin made a memorable call about how Cigar capped his perfect 1995 season. A break of three to Jed Forrest, followed by Tinner's Way. Concern is still last. Three for long to go. Cigar! Cigar makes his move, and he sweeps to the lead with a dramatic rush with three for longs to go. And Jerry Bailey turns him loose, and he guides him down to the rail as the field turns for home. Unaccounted for it down inside a quarter of a mile between Cigar and a perfect season. Coming down to the last for long with a two and a half break lead. And Jerry Bailey calls on Cigar for everything he has. But Terry has a weakening second on the inside on a common board. On the outside, so the winner. There he is, Cigar. We have been witness to racing greatness. Cigar, 12 in a row, an unbeaten season. And he did it in style, 159 and 2. Well, Cigar may not go down in history with some of the other great race horses because he didn't reach his stride until he was a little older. He wasn't a great three-year-old. And he was also infertile, so he never sired any great horses to come after him, but for a while he was the greatest living racehorse, and no racehorse ever had a better season than he did in 1995. We're going to move on now to Vic Braden, who died recently at the age of 85, and Vic Braden was one of the great tennis coaches in American history. He was a good tennis player, was a three-time state champion in Michigan. He went to Detroit when he was in high school and learned from the great Don Budge. And while he had a nondescript career as a professional tennis player, what he had was a great mind and a great personality, and he could break down the physics and the psychology of the sport, so much so that people in other sports sought him out. He taught everybody from two-year-old kids to Tracy Austin, who was a two-time U.S. Open champion. He was on television. He wrote articles. He was a popular guy, and everybody in the tennis world recognized him as sort of a tennis guru. But one of the things about him was he emphasized that it didn't take incredible natural talent to be good at tennis. Here he is talking in a couple of promos, and you get an idea of what kind of guy he was. Tennis is two people playing a game where normally a team has many more, so you're primarily responsible for your wins and losses. One of the tough things about the game, but a beautiful thing, you learn how to take losses because... 50% of all the people who play tennis today around the world will lose. That's a big number. And so, from my standpoint, it's a great game because health reasons, social reasons, and so on. But it's a great game. We did a study on why people played this game, and I thought we'd get four or five answers. Sunshine, friendship, social relationships, and so on. But actually, we got 102 reasons why people played tennis. And so... It's a great game because it has so much to offer. Here he is on the mechanics of the game. The biggest mistake I think uh, beginners make is not getting good information. Uh, tennis is a physics problem. You can't violate physical laws. A racket's meant to do certain things. And if you can get the right speed, the right trajectory, and the racket head is positioned properly, you're going to be good. I don't care if you played one month or, or 5,000 months. The idea is that one is good information there are awful lot of good research out there and some coaches don't they, they just don't care about research they say do it this way because I said so but there are a million myths in this game you can find coaches who have played I, I remember one of the coaches who was in the top 20 and he came to me and he said you know when I got off the tour I was pretty sure that nobody could tell me anything about this game 
Then I found out when I became a teacher, I didn't know a thing. And I had to really learn all over again about the human body, what forces can it take, what can I expect, the, the 16 brain types, the individual differences, fast twitch, slow twitch fibers, uh, all that is extremely important. But a lot of the players who are natural players never even thought about these things. But when you're going to coach, you're affecting the life of a lot of people. And there are a lot of people who are out of this game very early because they got poor information. Dick Braden. We're going to move on now to somebody I might not have done in the sports world had it not been for a cast I did about two months ago. Two months ago, I did Alice Coachman Davis, who was the first female African-American gold medal winner. She won the gold medal in the 1948 Olympics in the high jump, and at the time I mentioned that she beat a British competitor who jumped the same height as her, but she did it on her first jump. Well, that unnamed British competitor she beat was Dorothy Tyler. And in one of those coincidences that we often see in these podcasts, Dorothy Tyler died recently at the age of 94, only a couple of months after Miss Coachman Davis, and she had quite a compelling story herself. She was a high-jumping prodigy. She was one of the great female British athletes in history, and she was the first British female to win an Olympic medal when she won the silver medal in the high jump in 1936 in Berlin. She'd been identified as a prodigy by Harold Abrams, who was the British track and field star who was immortalized in Chariots of Fire, and when she went to Berlin, she actually cleared the gold medal height of 1.6 meters first. But she got job because the rule said if anybody else cleared that same height, there would be a jump off. And she lost the jump off to a Hungarian high jumper. Had it been today, she would have won the gold medal. She took her silver medal in stride. And one of the memorable aspects of that trip was her historic meeting with Adolf Hitler and Joseph Goebbels, which is described in the BBC4 Last Word by Matthew Bannister. That was Herr Hitler announcing it open. Now they're all turning him, and they, the whole crowd have raised their right arm. Mike Fleet is writing a biography of Dorothy Tyler. She shared her memories of her visit to Germany with him. Well, I think she was a bit stunned, and she told me that uh, when they arrived there, the, there was music playing, and she noticed the banners with swastikas. She was aware of the Hitler youth marching around with shovels on their shoulders and things like that. So it was a bit of an eye-opener for her. Didn't she actually meet Adolf Hitler and, and, and Josef Goebbels? Certainly she did. Very dismissive of him, and she thought the other guy was a bit of a womaniser. <laughs> Goebbels? Yes. We went on to a beautiful island. He only invited the women, not the men. And there was beautiful decorations, butterflies lit up, beautiful food and drink. And I actually stood next to Hitler. Well, the story of her career gets even better. In 1939, she broke the women's world record for the high jump, but the record lasted only a couple of minutes because it was later beaten by a German high jumper. She was upset because she felt that the German high jumper was a man. She suspected this during the 36 Olympics in Berlin, and she wrote a letter to all the officials, and lo and behold, it turned out that he was indeed a man. The Germans were using this man-woman thing long before the 60s when we all found out about it. What happened was that the Nazis knew that it was a man, but they disguised him because their only other good female high jumper was Jewish, and they didn't want to use a Jewish female high jumper. Unfortunately, she didn't get her official world record back until 1957 because it took that long for the world governing body to recognize what actually happened. She got jobbed a third time in the 1948 Olympics. She was that good. She was jumping 12 years after her first Olympics when Alice Coachman Davis beat her in London in the ones we talked about. They both cleared 1.68 meters, and Alice Coachman Davis did it first, just like Dora Tyler had done in 1936. If they had done what they did in 1936 and had a jump off, Dora Tyler almost certainly would have won because Alice Coachman Davis injured herself during her jump. But they changed the rules, and now the rules were whoever jumped at first won. The same rule that cost her from winning it in 1936. So she won a silver medal, one of the only people to win medals before and after World War II. She jumped for several more years after that, and after she retired, she became, like Vic Braden, an innovative coach in her sport. I'm going to move out of sports now and move on to Jeffrey Holder, who died at the age of 84. He was the Trinidadian actor who was famous for his role as a villain in the James Bond Live and Let Die, but he was far more than an actor. He was a choreographer, a dancer, 
a Tony Award winner, and they dim the lights for him on Broadway when he died. Here's the Huffington Post and Jeffrey Holder. Jeffrey Holder, the Tony-winning actor, dancer, and choreographer, known to millions as Baron Sandy in Bond movie Live and Let Die, has died at 84. His other films included 1982 musical Annie, in which he played Punjab. More recently, Holder's distinctive bass voice was heard narrating Tim Burton's 2005 film version of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Holder won two Tony Awards for Best Costume Design and Musical Direction in the original Broadway production of The Wiz, an all-black version of The Wizard of Oz. To me, he's most famous for this great television commercial from the early 70s. These are cola nuts. They grow here. They're used to make cola-flavored soft drinks. These, on the other hand, are uncola nuts. They grow here too. But as you can see, they're a bit different from cola nuts. Rather larger, for one thing. Rather juicier, too, I'd say. Marvelous little things, uncola nuts. We use them, of course, to make the uncola seven up. It's the uncola nut that helps give the uncola its je ne sais quoi. You know, fresh, clean taste, no aftertaste, wet, wild, all that. Marvelous, absolutely marvelous. Just try making something like that out of a cola nut. Why, it's even prettier than a cola. Nuttier than a cola, actually. <laughs> yeah, he was great there. Here he talks about coming to New York courtesy of Agnes DeMille in the early 50s. It appeared where Limelight was the move, we're playing Charlie Chaplin, and all the New York, all the record shops were in la 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 and the girls looking like Janet Lee and little Elizabeth Taylor, the Irish girls, pretty, 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 pretty. And then you get my folk, who dressed to kill. It was a beautiful sight. I will never forget that period. But my uncle Johnny, who was here 40 years before me, said, Jeffrey, you know you can't go in here and you can't go in there. I said, why? If I can't go into a place, there's going to be something wrong with the place. Why should I want to go into a place that there's something wrong with the place? Anyway, I walked through many doors innocently because I knew what I wanted. And I went and I asked, hello, darling, how are you? How much is it? Ha ha. By the time we're through, <laughs> I am in and out there. I walk in there with style. The world is a very small world. You have to be bigger than life. And when you walk the street, I don't care who you are. And it's not about wearing Armani suits and expensive clothes. It's having a straight back and walking. Bam. And here he gives some advice to children. Ask questions. Or say, what's that? If you don't understand it, ask, what is it? What is a wonderful word? What's that? What is it? Be curious. Be very curious. The best playground for a child is the museum. If you can't afford to travel, take the child to the museum. If you like Boris Karloff and the mummy, go to the Metropolitan Museum and see a real mummy. All the history is right there. You don't have to go to Egypt. It's right here on Fifth Avenue. Ask, what is it? Why? Who? Find the answers. And don't be satisfied until that answer really falls in your basket. Because you're born, the kids are born with all the knowledge we have. They have I mean, there. Shakespeare is not dead. You could reach him. You find yourself quoting your mother when you grow older. You find yourself quoting your aunt when you get much older. You find yourself walking like your daddy when you get older. All the wise men are still here. It's all, we're all messengers. All that, why? What's that? And when you get that information, keep it until it falls in place, until you understand it, and share it with your best friend. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Taps, and we're going to close with the death of the Saturday morning cartoon. For over 60 years, American kids watched cartoons on Saturday morning. It was a staple of their behavior. Of course, that's probably why they weren't asking questions as Jeffrey Holder told them to do, but be that as it may. As of recently, there are no more cartoons on Saturday morning television. It's the result of a number of factors, changing tastes, the economics of producing cartoons, all the different networks, a federal intervention that demanded educational programming, which has been put on Saturday morning. So there are no more of the great Saturday morning cartoons or even the bad Saturday morning cartoons that several generations of American kids grew up with. So to close as a tribute to the Saturday morning cartoon, I'm going to play a familiar Warner Brothers melody the grandparents of today's children once listened to as they sat in front of that television screen on Saturday morning. Yeah.